The Out of Bounds Show podcast is brought to you by Live Oaks Golf Club and Roosevelt's at Live Oaks. Whether you're in the mood for a hot lunch or you want to go play a quick 18 with a cold beer, the only choice is Live Oaks Golf Club and Roosevelt at Live Oaks on Highway 49 North. WRKS Pickens Jackson. Are you ready? Now live from the Whiskey 61 Lounge inside the Bank Plus Studio. You are listening to Mississippi's number one sports talk show, The Out of Bounds Show with Bo Bounds. Streaming worldwide live on the Out of Bounds Radio app and on your radio at ESPN 105.9. The Soul. All right, the Out of Bounds Show, ESPN 105.9 The Zone, brought to you by Went McGee, the mortgage man, mortgagemanms.com. Went McGee, mortgagemanms.com. We're streaming live on the Out of Bounds radio app. I don't know who I'm pulling for in March Madness. I've got to pick a team at some point before, you know, not just the best, what could be the best team, a team that I'm actually going to root for. Maybe Bobby Huggins, Huggy Baby, at West Virginia. That dude's a cat. You know, I think he likes to party. He's a phenomenal basketball coach. You know, probably suffocates his offense, but dang, he demands that you play hard and play D. Um, I mean, he's at West Virginia. They're number six in the country. They all. It doesn't matter where he goes. They win. Cincinnati, he had some unbelievable teams. If Kenyon Martin, was it Kenyon Martin? I think if Kenyon Martin doesn't break his leg in the their conference tournament like 2001, uh, I mean, that guy was, a, at that point in time in basketball, he was ridiculous. He was kind of a three-foot, well, he was more of a power forward. Um, heck, you don't know. I mean, maybe since he wins it. But he moves over to West Virginia uh, I guess after getting rung up on that DUI or something. Anyway, because remember, AK Andy Kennedy took his place for for an interim year. But Huggy Bear is a uh, phenomenal coach. And look at Villanova, Jay Wright. Look at uh, Kelvin Sampson. He's just a phenomenal. Kelvin Sampson got hung, rung up for like five hundred and seventy violations <laughs> at Oklahoma. <laughs> As a basketball coach. Then he went to Indiana, and I think he got deemed again by the NCAA. Seriously. I mean, Oklahoma, it was like they made 834 calls outside of the recruiting window. And I want to say he got deemed at Indiana, too, but not as bad. Oklahoma was, now he had Oklahoma rolling. And then he goes to the NBA as an assistant for several years. Milwaukee Bucks and so on. That dude's at Houston. They're 20 and three, and I like him. I may have to, I don't know. Houston, West Virginia, Nova, kind of leaning that way um, right now. Yeah, I'd like your thoughts on March Madness. All right, the show is brought to you by the Bone In Filet at Kessler Prime in the Renaissance, and you can pair it with a uh, side of crawfish or mushrooms and then go with a Four Roses single barrel old fashioned. Uh, They've even got the private selection there, too, all at Kessler Prime in the Renaissance, KesslerPrime.com for a reservation. Farm Bureau Insurance call in line is 601. We're on the new number now, 601-707-3750. Twitter handle at Bo Bounds. Follow us on Twitter. And then the Mississippi Ag, John Deere Lawnmower and John Deere Tractor. Text line 601-885-3776. According to my text line, Devin Cooper, who is the new head football coach at Northwest Rankin, evidently had a great record at Scott Central. Uh, According to some on the text line, he doubled his pay. Oh. Going from Scott Central to Northwest Rankin. I don't know if that's true. That's good. Uh, But if it is true, as Blake just said, that's good when you double your pay, yeah. when you uh, when you make a move. Please and thank you. Yes, it is. I think Scott Central's down I twenty towards Meridian. Do I have that right? I'm pretty sure I do. Is Brad Cumbus from Scott Central? They've been th- th- they've been rolling out some athletes. Is there some kind of uh, 
manufacturing facility or something that employs a lot of people in that area. I, I, I would have to believe there's something going on there. It sounds like Scott Central seen some some growth, experienced some growth, and uh, I could be totally wrong just then on Who's where it? they are. East Central. Brad oh, Compass was at East. See, Central. there's too many. I get I get confused on uh, yeah, Scott Central, East Central, whatever. All right, out of bounds, 105.9 The Zone. Mike Dettelier coming up on the Shiner Bot guest line. Mike Dettelier at 8.30. Will Drew Brees make it official this week? That he's coming back? If I had to bet 100 bucks, <laughs> that he's coming. All right, so people got all hot and bothered. Let's just go ahead and rip the <laughs> Band-Aid off. People got all hot and bothered because he and his personal trainer showed Drew Brees uh, what, pushing a tire or something? Yeah, working okay. out, baby. So at 40, 41 years old, whatever he is, uh, Breeze throws up or his trainer throws up uh, some video of Breeze um, doing some kind of tractor tire pull, uh, which then people question why in the world you would do that if you're co- if you're starting your broadcasting career uh, and not playing football anymore. If I had to bet 100 bucks. I'd bet that, I mean, he's retiring. It, it's a done deal. Now, I don't know why they threw that up. Was that to mess with people, to have some fun? I don't know why you'd be, I get still training. Not sure I would be training, pull a tractor tire training, but whatever. Hey, keep your name in, in the news, right? Okay, maybe you need that for NBC Sports. I don't know. That's interesting. Maybe he's coming back. He's not. I'd like for him to. Then, then you know, you just write the Saints off right now. You take shot after shot at Houdat Nation. And Dude. it's it's really and, and it's they're a bad. better franchise than your franchise <laughs> right now. Man, right now. All right, listen. And they have been for fifteen years they've been better. Shoot, man. You you haven't played in an Drew NFC Bre- championship game since Bill Clinton was president. True Breeze can barely hold Tony Romo's clipboard. Wow. <laughs> um <sighs> You do realize that <laughs> your Cowboys haven't played in the NFC Championship yeah, game terrible. since Bill Clinton was president. Yes, but maybe this, we need to put Bill Clinton back in office. Get back to the title. That could game. happen. Let's do it. That could happen. <laughs> uh, did I have it right? Yes. Outside of force, is I what did. I thought it was out down I twenty towards Meridian. How about that for my geography? Proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. You can. Uh, we'll leave a, a tip jar outside the studio. <laughs> and um, we welcome that. Uh, Donnie and Clinton says, Bo, it's all about Jawan Howard. Go blue. Uh, Hunter Dickinson is a bona fide beast in the post. He's talking about the Michigan Wolverines. It is very rare that a really talented player comes in and is a really good coach, and Jawan Howard's done a magnificent job. It's, now, that, yeah. that Michigan program was super healthy under John Beeline. And Beeline, for whatever reason, thought he wanted to go to the NBA. He was at the Cavs for like five minutes, um, which was odd. But Juwan's done a great job, and Michigan's number two in the country. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, they're now a basketball school, according to Blake. They are no longer yeah. a foot. I'm not sure they ever really were. <laughs> it was just the Midwest Northeast media, you know, shoved that down our throats. But uh, Big Blue Nation, I guess. No, that's. That's Kentucky. But the Michigan Wolverines are now officially a basketball school. Neither State or Ole Miss are going to make the tournament. Nope. Um, you know, the Ben Hallen thing is interesting because if DJ Stewart comes back, you'll have Molinar. Stewart, oh, I'm leaning towards that he's coming back, Blake. Blake just did a major eye roll. Uh, if I've D- heard that a million times. DJ Stewart, Molinar, Smith, and Fountain. Probably that, that'll that be the best perimeter players that you've had uh, maybe ever. Yeah. Seriously, at the same time. And if I at hit the same time. a lotto ticket, I won't work here anymore. And then I Kermit mean. Davis Jr. had a tough loss against Vanderbilt over the weekend. They didn't even have their top two players, Vandy. And, and Ole Miss goes up there and loses. So that was a tough one, too. Uh, they'll lose Schuler, but well, I take that back. I guess technically he could come back, but I don't expect that to happen um, because I guess nobody gets dinged on eligibility this year. 
Hey, the show is brought to you by Mud Bugs. That's the number one place to go to for crawfish. Two locations in Rank in Rankin County. Mud Bugs has the best crawfish in Mississippi. Coors Light and crawfish. That's a winning combo. To till you at eight thirty. Oh, we have a, I think a Roll Tide fan on the Mississippi Ag John Deere tractor text line 601-885-3776. And he's talking a little Alabama basketball, but I'll take it into football. So last week, last weekend, Arkansas beat Bama. Bama's the best team in the league in hoops, all right? And JM says, Guys, Bama took it on the chin last week at Arkansas. I believe it was the worst officiated game ever. The refs swallowed their whistle when Bama had the ball and blew everything for Arkansas. Arkansas shot 43 foul free throws to Bama's eight. Have you ever heard of that? Well, first of all, I, I do remember seeing it, and that is a poorly officiated game. I guess Bama felt like what everybody else feels like in football. When Bama's offensive line is allowed to hold, you know, every game throughout the game and never gets a holding penalty, but you're for sure going to get a couple of holding p- penalties throughout the game when you're playing Alabama. So I guess that's the way I would look at Alabama. Alabama was treated like everybody else is treated in college football when you play Bama. Is that? Yep. That's accurate. Yeah. Like when a receiver steps out of bound on his own and then catches a 60-something yard touchdown? Yes. And they don't call it? Yeah. Even though the official threw his hat at the spot? Yeah. Not bitter about that. Let's go back to fans in the stands. <laughs> Please. Uh, the NFL there? is going to do it. It's, it's, they're, they're not. And look, we, as much as they get beat up, um, man, the NFL led the way yeah. of opening everything up. And, and we got SEC football, and we've had SEC basketball, and we have SEC baseball. And you just got a tip, you know, tip of the cap to to the NFL and their leadership um, for never for never checking up last March and doing a great job. You know, every every player and every coach from college and pro and football, you know, you, you had no deaths, thank God. And no serious hospitalizations either, uh, which was remarkable. Once all the, the the college, it was basically June 15th, but the NFL, I think they were they were rolling a little bit before then. Um, but but the NFL, you're going to be able to go. The, if you want to go to the Superdome this year and watch the Saints and their new quarterback, uh, you'll be able to go to the Superdome. Yeah. If you want to go watch Dak play, I guess in Dallas, I'm 99.99%. Uh, David Hellman definitely was like, it's he's playing for the Cowboys. Uh, you can go see Dak play. So that's a good thing, Blake. And then A&M and Bama have led the way. There may be some other schools that I missed, but Texas A&M and Alabama have come out and said, we're we're going full, full capacity. Well, that means LSU, Georgia, Florida are going to follow suit. They're not going to Auburn. They're not going to let them you know, outpace them, so to speak. I would hope that our schools are going to step up to the plate and make the decision in football that they should have already made in baseball, which is to let people come attend. Uh, uh, you're talking about baseball getting bumped well, up? Well, what I'm saying is I we're not stepping up to the plate for baseball now, so I, I mean, it does make me concerned. Will we step up to the plate for football in the fall? Oh, the pressure will be too much. If if you're the only, you won't be the only two teams in the SEC that uh, that are not doing full capacity at the stadium. I hope not. And I think you can tell. I think Keith Carter and the Ole Miss athletic department basically sent something out that said we're we're full speed ahead, expecting 100 percent capacity. And thank goodness. I mean, again, Duty Noble and Swayze should be 100 percent capacity uh, if if they choose. You know, if that many people choose to go. They should be. Right. I just don't get it. 
I don't, I don't get what MHSAA basketball tournaments at 50%. I don't understand. I thought that like all the state would be the same. Yeah. It's, Am I missing something or is there, are there certain, is it, is it up to your discretion? I don't, I did not. I thought it was set by the state as well, but to be fair, the state and the people running this have not known what they're doing from the beginning. So why would they start knowing now? Yeah. Well, no doubt. Uh, Federal and state have have struggled with this. Okay, and how like how are so A and M saying we're going full speed ahead in football? A, Bama full speed ahead. I'm pretty sure Ole Miss released something that said we're full speed ahead as you get as you look towards um, re-upping, renewing. Sorry, your season tickets. Did you see South Carolina is going back to 2000 and like 10 or 11? season ticket prices in honor of, I don't know if that's because of the lack of excitement, but Ray Tanner claimed because that was the last time Shane Beamer was at South Carolina. Nice. That's cool. Does that make any sense at all? No, but it's Ray Tanner. I understand. Ray Tanner's made no good decisions at South Carolina. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's the case, but you're right. He hasn't made a good football hire yet. Will Muschamp wasn't good. You know, Shane Beamer, I like Shane. I hope he does well, but there were so many other people you could have hired. <laughs> Literally it's, anyone. Now, it, for Mississippi State and Ole Miss, you pull them when Shane's there, you you feel pretty good about it. Good deal. Right? Yeah. Uh, was it... Oh, Ole Miss has played them within the last... Matt Luke and Will Muschamp, talking about a, a battle of SEC coaches of the year. <laughs> Luke and, and Muschamp faced each other Luke's last year, I think. I don't know when the last time MSU played South Carolina, but I do know that Dan Mullen and Mississippi State played South Carolina the week after they got beat by South Alabama, and they won. Yep. Now, they may have played them since... That was 2016, um, when Mullen opened up the season with the loss to South Alabama. But uh, maybe Ole Miss beat South Carolina last year, too. That, that may have happened. I want to say I... Maybe Kiffin got got must well, champ. Ole Miss doesn't play South Carolina again until twenty twenty five. Wow. Okay, that's a long time. Yeah, they uh, Ole Miss beat South Carolina fifty nine forty two last year. Yeah, that was it. Fifty nine forty two. Fifty nine to forty two. Yeah, ran them out of the stadium. Almost dropped sixty on the defensive specialist. Will Muschamp. There you go. Okay. Who is... Uh, He's now an analyst for Georgia. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, that's an interesting interesting setup. Yeah. We'll see. The the know. the analyst, uh, he's making like 300 grand, I think, as an analyst for Georgia. What a deal, too, right? I think that's a pretty sweet gig. You've now been bought out by Florida and South Carolina to the tune of, what, $30 million? Um... Plus what you made, you know, all those years as a head coach. Now you're back at your alma mater, uh, Georgia, with your buddy who you played with at Georgia, Kirby Smart. It's just going to be a good old time, man. There was a big name that joined Saban's staff, too, as an analyst. Ron Cooper. Right? Isn't that his name? Ron Cooper? The former coach from, like, Louisville. and Yeah, defensive coordinator at MSU for one year. It was a bad, bad year. Uh, I don't consider Ron a, a big name, but I... Well, that's who they just, like, announced that they signed gotcha. as the analyst. The, no, maybe... Are you talking about Doug Marone and well, Bill? The, but they're on the field. The fact that, that Saban was able to hire Doug Marone as a, what, offensive line coach who's a former head coach in the NFL? Yeah, that's remarkable. I think he only came because of Bill O'Brien, too. Well, I mean, I, I remember for, like, Saban's obviously attractive, but Bill O'Brien being there, I think, made that a... I think that was, there's a tie there. And so. for our listeners, Bill O'Brien is Alabama's new offensive coordinator. Correct. And Doug Marone is their offensive line coach. Bill O'Brien, the same man who thought trading DeAndre Hopkins, a top three receiver in the league, was worth the half-eaten tuna salad sandwich from a week ago that was a running back from the Arizona Cardinals. Wow. Wow. Mississippi State plays at South Carolina in 2023. Okay. What do you think? full capacity.
for the NFL and SEC stadiums. Thank goodness in 2021. According to AM and Bama, that's the direction they're going. The show is brought to you by Eye Care Professionals and Dr. Kirk Jeffries. Lakeland Drive, lay free LASIK and cataract surgery, I care profession. Everyone ready? This is the SEC Insider Hit. Hit, hit, hit. Presented by your local Farm Bureau Insurance agent. Go local. Go with a home team. All right, best crawfish in the state of Mississippi at Mudbugs, two locations in Rankin County. Their shrimp is amazing. Uh, Coors Light and crawfish, that's a winning combo. All at Mudbugs, two locations in Rankin County. And uh, delicious crawfish, shrimp, among other, their nachos are amazing too. Um, Highly, highly recommend those with a cold Coors Light. The weather this weekend is perfect for crawfish. Gets up over 60, 65 degrees. Get you some crawfish. Enjoy some college baseball. All right. We're live in the Bank Plus studio. Out of Bounds show. I'm your host, Bo Bounds. ESPN 105.9 The Zone. You can watch the show on YouTube. Search Out of Bounds Sports. Or you can watch it on Facebook. Search the Out of Bounds show. Uh, we welcome in our friend Mike Dettelier. WWL Radio TV New Orleans. He joins us on the Miller Light guest line and we've been talking about how Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson are are doing something that's uh, a little bit different uh today in that they're uh demanding some kind of say in some personnel decisions. You saw Brady do a little bit of it and so on. I think people think that Aaron Rodgers has been frustrated over the years at Green Bay. And uh Mike, I'd like to get get your thoughts where this could be trending. As far as uh, quarterbacks asking to have at least a little bit of say in maybe their offensive coordinator and a couple of personnel moves around them. Well, it's not like um, you reinventing the wheel. I mean, I I think that that's always been um, kind of a part of the position. You may have done it differently in years past where you and the head coach or you and the owner have that discussion. Um, I think in today's world of social media and sort of putting that flat platform out, they're getting, they're getting kind of the audience to back them up on this. And so it's not something new as far as NFL is concerned. I, I, I've always felt, just from being around guys that have played that position, that they have had those conversations. Um, If it's with the owner, the general manager, uh, the head coach. But it it was done differently. Now, you know, okay, if you're not going to listen real well, um, I'll take it to the streets, so to speak. And I'll, I'll put it on my media platforms and see what happens. And that becomes a lot of pressure then all of a sudden. So um, it's not something new, but how they are able to translate that is new. Mm, That's true. And and so I, I do think we're living in an age, too, where I think owners and general managers of teams are uh, another generation, younger, uh, younger people. They've they've earned their money or made their money a different way if you're an owner, much differently than in years past where it's uh, years of accumulation. Uh, A lot of times, you know, it's in the tech world. It's Silicon Valley. It's Tesla, Amazon, you name it. They've made their money quickly. So don't give me this stuff about wanting to build <laughs> over a course of time. I want it now. And it's, uh, it's difficult to tell that owner who's made his money quickly, he can't do it that way in the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball. It's, uh, it's difficult <laughs> to give them that explanation. So, uh, as the quarterback, you're you're in a position where 
you know, you hold a lot of the cards. And that's why I think you're seeing this sort of shuffle uh, all across the NFL uh, today. And you'll see even more that just lack lack of patience. And I'm going to move on. If I don't win, I'm moving on. And if you have an opportunity to pick up a star quarterback that can keep me relevant, that's nothing against the maybe guy. And, you know, because, Bo, I, I hear it on talk show radio. I, I hear it from social media. Just because you're after a star quarterback, that, that's not demeaning to the next guy that you might have went after if you don't get the star quarterback. You know, come on, in this world, that that's some reality check of a maybe person over the star guy. And and that's why I think there's so much interest in uh, Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson at this stage. Those are star players. Do you think Seattle will figure it out, Mike? Do you think, I'm, I'm sorry, do you think Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll will get on the same page and that no. Russell, no? I don't. I I don't see that happening. I think Pete thinks that he can do it without Russ. I don't think he can. I don't think you can do it in the. I think Pete thinks he drove. I mean, look, Pete's a good coach, and he's got a good culture, and no doubt he drove the team. But you have to have a playmaker at that position, and as a defensive-minded guy, I don't know if Pete really, really believes that you have to have that level of player to go all the way. You agree or disagree, Mike? I think Pete knows the importance of the quarterback position. But I think there's always uh, a relationship, that phrase, and I think this one has, between him and Russell. And it's almost every year that there's been some little incident occur. And I think Pete's willing, wanting to move on. Uh, Pete understood that um, when he first took over at Southern Cal, he was maybe the sixth or seventh choice for that job. Um, I remember Coach O telling me the story because O was there. He was there with Paul Hackett. Everybody got released but him. He was the, he was the only survivor. Uh, so, you know, like he said, every day there was a new name uh, in – the LA times or talk shows about the guy taking over. And then it became Pete, but basically Pete was the sixth or seventh choice of the people in power at USC at that time, but they needed a catalyst and he understood that. And then he went through an array of quarterbacks that very few teams uh, were able to go through. From Carson Palmer to Matt Leiner, Matt Russ, uh, Matt Castle. Uh, you think about uh, Booty was there also, Mark Sanchez. All in a course of about seven years at the college level. Come on, he ain't winning those games without those guys. But I do think he understands the quarterback position is – what it is, but I I think this has become personal between the two individuals. Mm. Uh, Pete's philosophy has always been he wants to run the ball. He wants to control the clock, uh, being able to run the football, and then that opens up the play-action game. And all that's true, but that and that can work at the collegiate level at that time, but today, that's not working anywhere. Uh, and one, your offensive line stinks in Seattle. It's not good. They've tried different running backs, and it hasn't worked since Marshawn Lynch. So, okay, you can have a philosophy. But if it doesn't work and you don't have the right people, what good is the philosophy? Mm. And so... I think this has become personal now between the two wow. parties here. So you, I, I, you think... I think it's become that way, and the divorce is going to happen. If it's this year or next, it's going to happen between these two parties. Mm. Because it's not going to change 
What makes you think that things are going to change in Seattle? They've traded their first-round picks off for Jamal Adams. They have three high picks. And listen, I'm a big fan of Jamal. I think he's a hell of a player. But he is who he is as a player. He's much more of a dominant guy closer to the line of scrimmage than a coverage guy. He's like a, a small linebacker who plays up front, can blitz, plays the run real well, that sort of thing. But you gave up three early picks and two first-round picks for Jamal Adams. So where's your help going to come from uh, offensive line-wise and that running back? Where is that going to be? You're up against the cap financially. Uh, <laughs> you you got some maneuvering to do. And is Pete the genius uh, – when it comes down to the draft, maybe yeah. a guy other than DK over the last four years that he's picked up in the draft. Yeah, and he, he got DK with the last pick of the second round. That's a great point. Mike Dettelier on the Miller Light guest line. So, uh, for our listeners, Mike doesn't think that Russell will be in in Seattle for the long haul. Maybe this year, uh, but eventually they'll they'll get a divorce and and move on, which will be fascinating to see where he lands and what Seattle does next, because Pete Carroll can't win with a Matt Flynn-type QB. He may think he can, but he can't. So not that, that that would be the guy, but I'm just throwing that out, who Pete signed right before they drafted Russell. All right. Uh, do you also, uh, Paul Allen passed away, and uh, Paul did have his, the owner of the Seahawks, he did have his finger on kind of what was going on, and his sister has inherited the team. She didn't care anything about it, and there's discussion that Pete makes all the calls now, even over and above John Snyder. Have you heard that, and do you agree with that, Mike? I think Pete and, and Paul Snyder and, and John Snyder work as a tandem. Okay. I, I really think they do. Uh, now, I, I think Pete has final say, but I think they sort of work as a tandem. Um John, I think, has always billed himself as this personnel guru, and uh, at one time I think really was uh, he. You know, man, he hit he hit on a lot of picks, and then it soured on him. So, not knowing the inner workings of what goes on there, and I suspect uh, uh, both of them uh, sort of screwed up picks that um the the part that's missing here is Pete Carroll the quasi general part-time general manager is messing up Pete Carroll the head coach. Yes. Uh, I think very very much like we saw what happened in Houston uh with a head coach that I think was a pretty decent head coach but he was a terrible GM. He got way too much power involved here. And so, <laughs> in ownership, who knows what the hell's going on there. But um, I think that there comes a point, very few guys can do it. Listen, as much as I think, and I, I'm a true believer in this, that in our lifetime, Bill Belichick is the greatest head coach ever, you know, and he, the record proves it. But his work as a GM in making draft choices has been has been lousy the last few years. Now, almost as though he's overthought every pick and hasn't worked out for the most part. Now, now, again, name me a big time player over the last four years that he's selected via the draft. Other than okay. DK? No, I'm talking about Oh, Belichick. Bill Belichick. No. No. I mean this and and evidently he tells everybody starting in in late you already know this, Mike, in late January, I've got the draft from here and it just doesn't it doesn't work out for him, Mike. No, you you got to have somebody in your ear that has watched these guys and watched them play. Um Rick Venturi, who's a good friend of mine who coached with the Saints for a long period of time and was and and is a close friend of, of Belichick. He coached with him in Cleveland. Uh, Bill tried to get him sort of out of retirement to go coach with the Patriots. And and he's made me this 
comment more than one time that, Bill, when it comes down to a veteran player, is much, much better in an evaluation than he is with a college guy. In that he tries to sort of what I call loop a player. Okay, I, I had a Mark Bavaro with the Giants as an assistant. I want Mark Bavaro. Find me the next Mark Bavaro in the college ranks. Um, I had Carl Banks, you know, with the Giants. Find me a linebacker like Carl Banks. And, and so he sort of loops. I'm looking for that next guy that's just like him. And sometimes you find out when you sort of pigeonhole yourself like that, you're going to make mistake after mistake after mistake. Uh, so, it's a good uh, point. Uh, I think what Rick is saying is that hey, he he needs someone that he can trust, not just a yes man around him that says, "Oh yeah, coach, <laughs> you right about that." And he's got, and he's had those type players and those type people around him that he needs somebody to say, Coach, that guy's not Bavaro. That guy's not Leonard Marshall. That guy is not uh, a Curtis Martin. Okay, you, this is who I think would fit very well with us. And yes, he picked Gronk. And yes, he, he was able to get Brady. But, boy, he's had a lot of whiffs the last few years. And that that's a tough evaluation because also you're looking at an environment in today's world where he is really tough on a player. He puts a lot of pressure on a player to mentally understand what you have to do in every situation and physically tough. You know, you've seen NFL films with the deal of, hey, guys, uh, you know, if you can't take criticism, then I don't want you here. You know, you know, and he's riding these players pretty good. And some guys don't respond to any of that though anymore. You, you know, you're not living in your grandpa's world or your dad's world of coaching. It's it's a lot more understanding the player and what motivates them, and sometimes jumping them is the worst thing for them, you know, because I work with former players that tell me if you told somebody even 20 years ago or 25 years ago, jump them, they would get in a shell and wouldn't play well. You you had to understand how to handle them. And it's like that in the workplace environment, right, that we all work in. There are some people you can jump on and maybe kind of hard sell them on something, and they get it, okay? And it doesn't affect them. You tell somebody one little thing they do negative, and it's like you stole money from them when they were like six years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh... So, uh, you know, so you understand that there's some sensitive in the tookus world that we live in. That's what makes what Nick Saban does at Alabama remarkable, okay? Um, I'm not saying he doesn't care about your feelings, but if he's going to tell you something, he's going to tell you, and you just got to accept it. And he's trying to make you better. But not everybody's like that. And I, I do think we're living in that reality world of professional sports today. You may not like it. You may scream and holler about it. But guess what? You better live in it because that's what you're going to see uh, for the rest of your life where there are going to be some dominant personalities like a Brady and a LeBron James who sort of takes over an organization mm. and with personnel decisions. And you've got head coaches that maybe in their 40s or early 50s understood, but as they get older and they stay in the business, man, listen, I'm hard-headed. I'm going to do what I want. You do what you want and you get beat. Right. Okay. Well, there's and a it, lot of blame. You know, I, The Athletic had a great article on Russell Wilson and, and Carol and put the blame on both men. Um, 
which I thought was good. But, but I mean, it laid I, out. I think this. I, I do believe this about most star athletes. If they feel their head coach got their back, they're not turning on them. Okay, because it worked for a long time in New England with Brady and Belichick. It worked because I think both guys felt, I got your back, you got mine. But there came a point, and I think you can trace this back to the Jimmy Garoppolo situation, where um, I think that's where the straw broke the camel's back. Okay. You think about two strong personalities, Drew Brees, Sean Payton. Yeah, tell me how much they tied up. Like how much they did didn't tie up much of anything? Okay. Because I think Sean always had Drew's back. Okay. And I think Drew knew that. And he he always had Sean's back. Even when this team was going through seven and nine, eight and eight season. Okay, did did you ever hear Drew kind of go off on Sean? Never. No. Even when you, he knew he was playing on some lousy defenses, never said a word. It worked because I think both guys felt as though they had each other's back in this. But I think even with all the success, at the end, it came down to a hard feelings between Belichick and Brady. Okay, it, it came down to that. And now it's the same thing in Seattle. And Houston. I mean, Okay. And it, ha- it happens in Houston. Uh, so it happened in L.A. Okay, golf leads you to the Super Bowl with McVay, and then things start to unravel a little bit. Was it all golf's fault? No. Right. Was it all McVay's fault? No. Right. But I think the Eagles got involved, and sure was, man, I ain't going down with the, in the Titanic with you. Uh, off you go, and I'm bringing in Stafford. Well, what about Dak? I've only got a minute, unfortunately. We're not going to be able to really do this. Um, it won't be Dak and his head coach, but Dak may be finally, even though he's evidently got a great relationship with Jerry and Stephen Jones, he may be getting to the point, if they don't get something done in the next seven to eight days, where he gets pretty ticked off. Mike, I've only got a minute. Your thoughts? Well, I think with that, it has nothing to do with money or I got your back. I think it all has to do with the length of the contract where I think Dak wants a shorter deal, feeling as though that I can hit the jackpot again. And that may be agent-driven, okay, which we all know happens in this world. And then Jerry puts the line of, nope, it's got to be my way. It's got to be this length of time. And Dak's people feel, let's do it shorter. Let's do the shorter deal. Mm. So I think that's the riff. It's different than, say, certainly Deshaun and Pete and, gotcha. and what's happening with Pete and uh, Russell. It's it's different because it all comes down to the length of the contract. But then hard feelings get involved, too. <laughs> you don't want to move, and I don't want to move. Right. All right, Mike Natelier, NFL Insider, WWL Radio TV, New Orleans. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you both. Man, he's awesome. At Mike Natelier on Twitter. He joined us on the Miller Lite guest line. The show is brought to you by Capital Preservation Services. Todd Martis and their team will take care of you and your business. Earn more and keep more with Capital Preservation Services. Earn more and keep more with Capital Preservation Services. Todd Martis and the team at Capital Preservation Services will help you earn more and keep more. Hour number three next. 